of that commonwealth, or the loose confederation of ex-British colonies that recognizes the Queen and their common British colonial heritage. As a Canadian-American dual citizen, I am part of it, and thus it is my duty to lay down my life for the Empire and Queen whenever it calls in future wars. However, my chances of that actually happening are quite low, as Britain is no longer a great military force, and it will likely not get involved in any future major wars without the Americans as their main partner. And frankly, my American citizenry is 1,000 times more likely to get me killed in the near future. Meanwhile, look at France. Although we don't often think about it, by many accounts, France is still a colonial power. Large parts of West Africa's economy are based on the Franc d'Afrique, and these countries export goods to France in exchange for their leaders getting political protection. Hell, we even have the president of Gabon on record saying, my country is the car and France is the driver. And France is currently fighting multiple wars in West Africa to maintain their regional dominance and prevent the jihadis from taking over. This isn't stuff that was happening 10 or 50 years ago, this is literally happening right as of this moment. And one of my favorite YouTube channels, Caspian Report, has an interesting series of videos discussing France's control and influence in West Africa, and the link to which is in the description if you want to learn more. So what if Britain followed the same route? What if Britain remained a world power, a colonial power? What if my duty to die for the Queen as a Canadian actually meant something? And what would happen if Britain could wield the Commonwealth as a united political force like a mace? What would the world look like today? What would borders, culture, and geopolitics be like in this world? That is the question of this alternate history. A relatively easy way to start this alternate history is to have the Imperial Federation movement succeed. Before 1900, there was a general movement and idea of forming an imperial federation or an imperial parliament to get the white dominions like Canada or Australia to cooperate more closely with Britain. And it didn't work or gain much traction for many different reasons. First of which is that the white dominions didn't want to lose their own autonomy in a organization like this. And secondly, the British didn't want to give up their preferential trading system that was very useful for them economically and give more props to the white dominions. And thirdly, I have the sneaking suspicion that the British elite still viewed the dominions as colonial Johnnies who weren't worthy of getting the political power that would come from a parliament like this. So let's say a frenzy of colonial idealism splashes across the empire around 1895, an imperial parliament is formed. Let's say Rudyard Kipling writes a series of best-selling novels that gets everyone whipped up into a pro-empire frenzy. An imperial parliament is founded out of London with powers similar to the modern EU when the white dominions are given some economic props and a customs union as part of Britain's preferential trade system. Over time, the different nations would be given equal voting rights, but Britain would be able to maintain de facto dominance due to its military and economic superiority and power inside the system. This combined leadership would have done the empire quite a bit of good during World War I. Before the war, all the white dominions had very romantic notions of Britain as the motherland and all that stuff. But having the English upper classes mess up the war so badly disavowed them of most of those notions, and each of the white dominions had their own moment of national self-realization and it was almost always a nasty battle in which they realized that they had more in common with each other than they did with the British back at home. For the Australians and New Zealanders, it's Gallipoli, and for the Canadians, it's Vimy Ridge. However, in this world, with the combined imperial parliament leadership, the colonial elites would be just as implicated in the suffering of World War I as the British. And so this would have slowed down the process of the Dominions developing their own national identities rather than just thinking of themselves as Brits abroad. In this world, the Dominions would continue to support the greater British cause and empire after World War II. Countries like Canada, Australia, and South Africa would maintain large militaries to support the Imperial Federation and the empire. The second thing the British could have done would be to include India inside this federation. In our world, the British got the Indians to sacrifice huge amounts of men and spirit into World War I as part of an implicit promise they'd gain more autonomy after the war. However, the 1920 Indian Constitution was more brutal than anything that had been seen for a long time. 
and this caused a falling out between the Indian elite and the British, and then the Indian elite turned towards independence. So perhaps if the British had given India more autonomy in 1920 and included it inside the Federation, they might have been able to keep it inside the Empire. However, I doubt it. If the British gave India independence or a position in the Imperial Parliament, there is no way they could have controlled it or kept it as part of their strategic agenda. India made up 70% of the whole British Empire's population comes from a wholly different civilization that is 4,000 years of history and has its own strategic and geopolitical issues based off its own geography. Even if the British were the kindest people in the world, which they weren't, the Indians, having their pride wounded by being conquered by a, such a smaller nation and having the need to demonstrate that they were a strong new nation would spurn the British. Thus, there is no way the British in a weakened state after the World Wars could have held on to India. In our world, the British could have held on to their empire after World War II if they wanted to, similarly to the French. And the way I'm going to pull this off is by having Marxist rebellions in Africa. Maybe the British universities that the African elites attended were slightly more Marxist in this world. And since the Western world, and especially the big powerhouse of it, America, was terrified of communism in this era, the United States would have given Britain massive aid to fight off communist rebellions inside Africa. And unlike Germany and France, who invested their American aid after the Second World War in rebuilding their economies and infrastructure, the British invested it in welfare that they thought they deserved since they won the war. And this had a much better effect on the German and the French economies in the long run. But in this timeline, Britain would be forced to invest large parts of their American aid inside the empire, and so they would want to maintain the empire afterwards. Let's say the British are able to crush these communist rebellions in Africa. In our world, the British are able to crush a pretty nasty Malay communist revolt in the 1950s, as well as the Mau Mau rebellion in Kenya. I'm not entirely sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Africa in this era was relatively technologically primitive, and that would give Britain an enormous administrative and technological advantage. There are two spots the British should have exercised influence in after World War II if they wanted to maintain their political power, the first of which would be South Africa. South Africa and Canada are sort of similar in that they have Anglo-descendant populations, but at the same time, they have a, another European diaspora's population that they have to share the country with. The big difference is that the Quebecois are a minority in Canada, while the Afrikaners, or people of Dutch descent, are the larger group in South Africa. And in our world, after World War II, in the decline of British influence, the Dutch Afrikaner Ethnic Nationalist Party won, pulled South Africa out of the Commonwealth, instituted apartheid, and pulled South Africa out of the general world economy in general, and ruled the country unopposed for 40 years. This was actually a killing blow for the British Empire in Africa. South Africa, a nation with a large white population, was a bedrock for British control in the region. The South African Anglos were significantly more tolerant than the Boers, having limited support for non-white populations. A non-apartheid South Africa in which the Anglos maintained more control could have remained a bedrock of British power in Africa, and also would not have created a rift with the black African regimes of the empire. The elections were quite close, so the British likely could have prevented the results by quietly influencing the elections similarly to what the US did in France and Italy with the communists in 46 and 47. The second period in which the British could have applied force to maintain their empire would be the Suez Crisis. In 1956, the British had given Egypt full independence, but tried to maintain control over the Suez Canal. The Egyptians had seized it, and a British, French, and Israeli coalition attacked and seized the Sinai and the Suez Canal. But pressure from the United States and the UN forced the British and the French to give this up. But in this world, the Americans would either never give this advice, or the British would simply ignore it, and thus inside this world, the British would sick themselves on Egypt. If the Arab-Israeli wars and the US invasions of Iraq are demonstrative of anything, it's the pathetic nature of Arab armies in the 20th century. And so the British likely could have won this war and could have installed a puppet regime in Cairo without too much bloodshed. And this is demonstrative of how the British also could have maintained control in Iraq. And in our world, the British maintained lots of influence in Iraq and Iran into the 1950s for mostly oil-based reasons. And before 1958, Iraq's last time of being run by a native regime was 539 BC. And so, as areas of the world go, 
this is one of the easier areas to occupy and maintain control over. In this world, the British and the Americans likely have a sphere of influence going from Saudi Arabia to Iran and Pakistan. The British would give their colonies technical independence like in our world, and seats inside the imperial parliament. But the British would use all the methods that we described the French doing earlier in this video, such as financial and political manipulation, to maintain de facto control over their colonies. For example, Britain would maintain military bases inside their former colonies, and only pro-British leaders would ascend to power in the former colonies, and if they did, Britain would be sure to remove them. Malaysia is interesting here in that the British fought a 12-year successful war to defeat communism in Malaysia in our world, only to give away independence when they had run out of energy. In a world in which Britain had more power, it follows that Britain would maintain influence here, right? However, all of Malaysia's neighbors were fully independent, and the nearest British ally would be Australia. Thus, in this world, Britain would likely maintain influence in Malaysia, but it would be the weakest link in the Commonwealth's chain. One of the larger reasons for the collapse of the British Empire was the dismantling of Britain's preferential trading system with the colonies. During World War II, in exchange for American aid, the United States forced Britain to get rid of its trading systems with the colonies that allowed uncompetitive British manufacturers to compete with the more efficient nations like Germany or America, and this resulted in the decline in British industry. And in this world, we may have seen the Americans reallowing the British to have their preferential trading systems as a way of paying for their wars against African communism and stabilizing their colonies. And remember, in our world, the French still maintain preferential trading systems with their former African colonies. And this would have allowed the British Rust Belt towns like Manchester, Leeds, or Sheffield to maintain their industries, and this would have done the British economy a world of good. Thus, we never would have seen the leftward shift of politics after World War II, and at the same time, we never would have seen the Thatcherite reaction, with British politics remaining more in the middle. Since Britain would have a strong trade network with its colonies and enormous cultural connection with the Commonwealth, it never would have joined the European Union. This would ironically make the Union more powerful, as it would effectively be a club of the Germans and French. However, this sense of direction might make the Union less inclusive, as any sense of direction would probably piss off some prospective members. <coughs> Greece. <coughs> Cyprus. Would the African nations part of the Imperial Federation be better or worse off? In general, they'd be the same, except for two subdivisions that would be better. In general, the colonial elites and the African dictators weren't actually that different. Neither really cared about the well-being of their people and were there to exploit the resources and send the wealth back to London or Paris. And most African dictators are from different ethnic groups than most of their people, and so not much really separates them from the European colonizers except skin tone. If we compare the regions in our world that remained under French guidance and those that gained full independence, there's no real difference. They're both equally poor. Two different kinds of regions would do better in this world. The first of which would be those run by true monsters, like Mugabe in Zimbabwe or Idi Amin in Uganda. Francophone Africa never produced leaders this evil because the French government would get rid of them, and that's what the British would do in this world. The second kind of region that would do better would be those with significant white minorities. Areas like Rhodesia, South Africa, and Kenya. The white populations would demand a level of security and protection similar to that that exists inside their home countries. And also remember in this world, Canada and Australia are significant military power and would likely help out their British colonial kin through thick and thin. Stability and property rights are the number one recipe for economic progress, but would any of this filter down to the non-white populations? Would these countries be horrifying apartheid regimes, or would they be inspiring examples of multiracial cooperation? The big brother of all these white minority countries would be South Africa, and thus the path South Africa would take would likely be demonstrative of the route the other white minority nations would take. And in our world, in South Africa before apartheid, we were actually seeing more racial integration as the colored minority or mixed race population was given voting rights inside the Cape and had more societal and economic integration. However, this was the passion project of the Anglo population, and as the Afrikaner nationalists seized power after World War II, they moved South Africa in the geometrically opposite direction towards apartheid. However, in this world in which the Anglo population would be significantly more powerful, we likely would have seen the integration of the coloreds into the white ruling class as well as the Asian minority populations. Meanwhile, giving political and economic power to the majority black population would be difficult, as they would be 70% of the population. 
and thus surrendering them power would effectively be political suicide for the white elite. The other white minority countries in this region would likely take a similar route to South Africa, giving certain tribes inside their countries political and economic integration. And I'm not entirely sure if by 2020 in the present, if they would have full suffrage, but with the military and political support of the other Commonwealth nations, it wouldn't entirely be necessary. In our world, the apartheid regime was isolationist economically and antagonistic towards its neighbors. But with a racially less odious regime, South Africa could have been a force for economic growth and regional cooperation. The South African region would in general be in better shape with forming a trade alliance with Namibia, Rhodesia, South Africa, and Botswana. Botswana would be a big winner, being a black-run nation with the most stable democracy in sub-Saharan history, and pretty rich by African standards, it would benefit from the trade union enormously. Over time, Britain's population would generally stagnate, while Canada, South Africa, and Australia's would skyrocket. By the present day, the populations of the Dominions would surpass Britain's by nearly 20 million. Thus, we would start to see these nations become more influential than Britain in aggregate. Australia would be the dominant power in New Guinea and Malaysia, and South Africa in its neighboring countries. As they would form a trade bloc, there would be significant migration within the Commonwealth. For this reason, you could easily see bizarre creations like Little Canada's in Botswana, or Kenyan neighborhoods in Sydney. The British maintaining influence inside the Near East would prevent the rise of pro-Soviet military dictatorships, and military dictatorships in general. These leaders held back their nations by promoting isolationist and protectionistic economies, and using the West's secular ideology as a sort of backing and protection for it. The British tried to support monarchies inside their domains inside the Near East, and the monarchies almost nearly universally did better because the monarchs had the traditional societal structures to hedge in their power and prevent them from going full kleptocracy. And that's why in countries like Morocco and Jordan are places you want to visit, and Iraq and Syria, which were military dictatorships, are places you really don't. The monarchies have been quite good at dealing with fundamentalism and fighting it with a variety of different methods, and not a single Middle Eastern monarchy, with the exception of Iran, where the Shah was an imposter installed by the Anglo-Americans to replace the real monarchy that came before, has fallen to fundamentalism. And in our world, the French have been quite good at preventing the rise of and dominance of jihadis and fundamentalism inside their West African sphere of influence. And in this world, due to a combination of monarchy and British influence, the general fundamentalist upswing of the 2010s would have been significantly weaker in this world. And countries like Iraq and Egypt would not have seen the Arab Spring, thus limiting it to Syria. And also, there never would have been the American invasion of Iraq. And thus, for all these regions, this area would likely have a stronger economy due to the string of stable monarchies bordering each other, thus promoting economic growth. Iran likely still fell to fundamentalism. The Shah's regime would likely still be brutal. Due to the mountains and the unified national organization of the Iranian people, Iran is very difficult to invade, and neither the British nor the Americans would be willing to invade or launch a coup. So I haven't mentioned the Cold War, the rise of China, or Anglo-American relations. That's because those really haven't changed. This alternate history doesn't change the vague details of our own history very much. And I think the British Commonwealth could maintain importance even today. The economic interdependence of the imperial dominions would be deeply intermeshed and difficult to end. In our world, France, China, and the United States all maintain spheres of influence in the Third World, not that different from what Britain's doing inside this timeline. And as Africa's population is expected to more than double by the end of this century, and the Middle East always produces new surprises, the effects of this timeline will multiply as we move into the future. And so my grandson will have to make a part two video by the end of the century. This video was sponsored by an Australian fan named Stefan van der Wel, who really wanted to see this timeline and so sponsored it. And these videos are a hell of a lot of work to make. And I don't have the time to get to every great alternate history in the world. And so if you're interested in pursuing something similar, please contact me via Patreon or email. And if you like this timeline, please comment, subscribe, stay tuned for future videos, tell a friend, and have a great day.